right. Oh, this is loud. It's a big room. Okay, so we should start. And uh, welcome to the CICD track here on uh, KubeCon. How is KubeCon so far? <laughs> nah, nah, that bad? How is KubeCon so far? <laughs> All right, that's better. Yeah, I like it a lot as well. So uh, my name is Baruch. I'm the MC here. Not going to still. Just a minute of those fine gentlemen to do a little exercise with you and to wake you up, basically. That's the idea. How many of you know what progressive delivery is? Okay, a third of you. How many of you do progressive delivery? Okay, um, about a dozen hands. How many of you do progressive delivery on Kubernetes? Yeah, like a dozen. All right. So those gentlemen, Danny and Jesse, actually do progressive delivery on Kubernetes. That deserves a standing ovation. Everybody up? I kid you not, everybody up? Everybody up? Yes. Yes. All right, and now, when you are awake, welcome to this talk about progressive delivery on Kubernetes. Um, one thing, the slides are already in the sketch, in the scheduling um, application. So if you follow, want to follow along with your copy of slides, you're more than welcome to open it and download it. With that, Danny and Jesse. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining our talk on progressive delivery on Kubernetes. My name is Jesse Soon, and this is Danny Thompson. Danny and I are both part of the Kubernetes platform team at Intuit, and we both work on the Argo project. And if you're unfamiliar with Argo, Argo is a collection of open source utilities that uh, focus on application delivery on Kubernetes. And it's comprised of workflows, CD, events, and most recently, Argo rollouts. And today, we'll be talking about progressive delivery and, and our approach of achieving this on Kubernetes using Argo rollouts. OK, so if you don't know Intuit, Intuit is the company behind TurboTax, QuickBooks, and Mint. And about two years ago, Intuit started its journey onto Kubernetes, and it's been really successful for us so far. Uh, we basically, since then, we've gone all in on Kubernetes, and within Intuit, we have about 5,000 developers. About a quarter of them have been migrated onto Kubernetes. And here are some current statistics about our Kubernetes usage. Uh, one of the biggest things that Kubernetes enabled for us uh, was increasing our software delivery speed. And what you're seeing on the bottom is this graph of our weekly deployment history over the past year. Uh, this is using Argo CD, which is our GitOps-based uh, continuous delivery tool that we built. And currently, we're doing about 1,300 deployments per day. And as you can see from the graph, we feel like we've gotten pretty good at continuous delivery. OK, so before we get into progressive delivery, let's take a step back and talk a little bit about continuous delivery. So CD was all about shortening the time that it took to get your code to your users. And it did this by having these short and predictable software development cycles uh, using this continuous loop of developing your code, building it, testing it, and deploying it, all in this automated fashion. And while continuous delivery got us to a point where we can deliver software faster, it didn't necessarily make software delivery that much safer. Uh, and it turns out that most outages and problems occur when, after you make some kind of change in your environment. And with CD, you're actually making changes to the environments much more frequently. So really, updates are the most critical points in time that you need the most observability, uh, the most confidence, and a contingency plan for when things go wrong. So what developers started to do to mitigate this risk was they started using some new techniques and some old techniques to kind of deliver their software uh, with less risk. So these are things like canarying, blue-green, feature toggling, A-B testing. In fact, there's a good chance that many of you are already using some of uh, these techniques already. Uh, the term progressive delivery was coined by an analyst named James Governor, and he describes uh, continuous, progressive delivery as continuous delivery, 
with fine-grained control over the blast radius. And really what it's describing is this umbrella term that encompasses a lot of these like, existing techniques that developers have implemented to mitigate the risk in their software delivery process. So let's go back to that uh, original CD pipeline and see how progressive delivery might change the delivery process. So we still have those initial same three steps, uh, but what comes after the test phase becomes a lot more sophisticated. So instead of deploying to your entire user base, you only deploy to a small subset. Uh, and the way you can do that can be in many different ways. A common way is to just serve a small percentage of the traffic uh, to that new version. And then next, you wait and you see how well that deployment went through, through analysis. And by analysis, you're measuring metrics which you care about for your application. Uh, oftentimes, Google's four golden signals are used, which are latency, error, traffic, and saturation, uh, but not necessarily. Uh, then you determine, was my uh, rollout successful or not? And if it was, you progress, and you increase uh, that subset of users that you're exposing that new service to. If not, you abort, and you roll back uh, to that previous version. All right, so there's four basic building blocks to progressive delivery. The uh, first is user segmentation. That's being able to isolate a set of the users that you wish to target and expose them to that new version. Uh, basically, this is how you're controlling your blast radius. Uh, examples of this might be to dial in that traffic percentage uh, to a small amount. It could even be something more coarser grain, like, uh, like deploying to a geographical region or a city. Next is traffic management. And then once you decide how you want to segment your users, you find ways to direct uh, those users to the new version. And this is where things like service mesh and ingress controllers uh, become useful. Observability are things like tracing, logging, and metrics. And the metrics are what you are going to be relying on to measure whether or not that update is going smoothly. And finally, we have automation. And automation is uh, now that you've been collecting those measurements, uh, you can now automatically progress or abort that update uh, based on what was observed. So now that we have that 1,000-foot view, let's kind of narrow down in how this applies to Kubernetes. Uh, so with deployments, we have rolling update. Rolling update is all about trying to get you from version A to version B as quickly and safely as possible. However, it provides very few controls over that speed. Uh, you can kind of slow it down using things like max surge, min ready seconds, readiness probes. Uh, but these controls, they're not really suitable for more sophisticated rollout plans, as, at least when it comes to doing things like Canary. And although container readiness probes, uh, people do use to verify their new version, um, they're unsuitable for like, performing deeper or, or even temporary checks because these readiness probes are running for the entire life of that deployment. Uh, you also can't use external metrics. Like if the metrics you care about are in Prometheus, uh, you, it's gonna, you're going to have a hard time getting readiness probes to connect to Prometheus. And while rolling update can halt the progression of your update, it's unable to reverse that um, update. You can't automatically roll back when your metrics are starting to fail. So we talk to many of our developer teams to understand their use cases. And when you're supporting thousands of developers, you get, there's a lot of interesting and, uh, ideas and use cases that come up. And here are some of the common ones. Um, obviously, there's this need to automatically roll back when your metrics are failing. But we also got a lot of other interesting requirements, such as uh, they, people want to customize their success and failure criteria, or they still wanted a human manual gate somewhere in the deploy process. Uh, they also wanted to use their own business metrics uh, to evaluate if their update is going smoothly. And, and there were many others. So we came up with a set of requirements that we, of what we wanted to build. Uh, number one, the solution needed to be robust. Uh, not, early into the process, uh, we, tried, we had a lot of false starts trying to use things like Jenkins to power canary deployments or uh, canary analysis, and it ended up being extremely fragile. 
Uh, second, we wanted to build on top of industry standard tooling, things like Prometheus, Kayenta, service meshes, and have great integrations with those existing tools. And after talking with all the developers, it was obvious that we needed a very flexible solution in order to support all of their use cases. And finally, it needed to be declarative and GitHub focused. There's a lot of numerous benefits that you get with a declarative approach. So about a year back, we started the Argo rollouts project. And at the time, the scope was quite simple. It provided a drop-in replacement for a deployment and just give two additional update strategies, blue, green, and canary. And I'll just quickly go through what a rollout resource looks like to give you guys some background of what this, what this is. Okay, so this is a rollout specification. Uh, rollouts work exactly the same as a deployment. It manages the creation, scaling, deletion of your replica sets. And so the spec itself should be mostly identical to a deployment. Um, as I mentioned, it was meant to be a drop-in replacement, and we wanted that experience to be exactly the same. But what's different about a rollout is, are the new strategies. And here I'm showing a canary strategy. And what this is specifying is that during a deployment, it will first set a canary weight of 40%, meaning 40% of the total pods will be running that new version. And then the second step is going to pause for one hour. After that one hour, it'll increase the weight to 60%, pause again, and then increase the weight again, and so on and so forth. So that's uh, what we've been using for the past year, but what has been missing to this point was a way to perform canary analysis during the update and automatically promote or roll back the rollout based on that analysis, which brings us to the second phase of uh, our Argo rollouts, which focuses on progressive delivery. And so now Danny, uh, he'll walk you through the analysis CRDs and show you how analysis can be used to, uh, during a rollout to automatically uh, promote or abort a rollout. Thanks, Jesse. So in order to enable progressive delivery, we needed to introduce two new concepts, analysis and experimentation. And with each of these um, concepts, we realized that they could have their own CRDs. We didn't want to kind of add them into the rollout object. If we added them to the rollout object, we'd have this really long YAML that'd be kind of hard to parse. And each of these concepts can kind of stand alone on their own. And so to that end, I'm gonna first talk to analysis. So analysis enables the observability portion of progressive delivery. And so that allows our developers to define what they care about when we are rolling out a new version. And with this analysis, we made sure that we didn't include any orchestration into the analysis section, since we want the analysis to only focus on the analysis. And so we needed a way to kind of incorporate the orchestration part of saying rolling forward when you know your application is healthy, or rolling back if you notice errors. And so to that end, we integrated it with rollouts. So here's a rollout that has analysis. You'll notice it looks almost the same as the previous rollout that you were looking at earlier, except now we have an analysis section. And within this analysis section, we have something called a template name. So this template name is referring to a new CRD called a analysis template. I will talk to the analysis template in a minute, but here's what you need to know for now. So, when you make a change to your pod spec and the rollout is progressing through the steps we have listed in, under the canary, or the canary strategy, we will also create a analysis. That analysis is checking the success rate of requests to our service. If that success percentage drops below 90%, we consider the new version bad and we need to roll back. And so to that end, I will give you a quick demo of a rollout that uses analysis. So the first thing I'm gonna do is pull up my terminal. So we also, in addition to adding analysis and experimentation to Argo rollouts, we created a kubectl plugin for Argo rollouts. And we did it for two reasons. One, we wanted to be able to visualize our rollouts, 
And then two, we wanted to be able to automate some of our common operations on the rollout object. So what you can see here is a rollout object. You can notice that right now it's in a steady state. It's executed all the steps. And then under this metadata, we have a tree view. This tree view shows all the children resources created from the rollout. So you can see a replica set and a bunch of pods. And so now let me pull up the demo app. So this is our demo app. What you'll notice is that there are a bunch of floating dots going across the screen. Each of those floating dots represent a request to our backend service. Then our backend service has a predefined color that it will return, and that's the color that the dot takes on. You'll notice this little bar graph kind of slowly incrementing across the screen. That represents the percentage of, of that color that uh, the backends are returning. So in this case right now, we are 100% blue. Another feature of this demo app is we can modulate the error rate of the backend service. So if I change the slider to around 48%, 48% of the requests to the backend service will fail. And you'll notice in the, the floating dots, the, there are some darker ones. Those represent the failed requests. In addition, you can see the failed requests in the uh, bar graph at the bottom. So I'm going to bring that error rate back to zero to kind of get us back into a steady state. And now I'm going to make a change to our rollout. So I'm going to execute a, or I'm going to use our kubectl plugin to change the image from the blue version to the yellow version. And so the first thing it's going to do is it's going to create a new replica set with two new pods. And you'll notice now we'll start getting yellow dots floating across the screen in addition to the blue one. So give it a minute, and it'll soon reach around 40% of the traffic. In addition, we have this new concept called an analysis run that runs alongside the new replica set. That is the analysis that we were talking to earlier. So if our success rate drops below 90%, where this new version is bad and we need to roll back. So to actually demonstrate that, I'll change the yellow version error rate to 100%. And so either on this measurement or the next, you'll see a little red X here indicating that the measurement was a failure and we need to roll back. So it looks like this one just missed it, so give me another five seconds. And there you go. We had a failed measurement, and now we realize that this version is bad, and we need to roll back. And so we scaled up the old blue versions first, and now we're starting to scale down the yellow ones. And you'll notice that now the blue dot, there's only blue dots floating across the screen, and the bar at the bottom is all blue. Now I'm going to simulate a successful rollout. So I'm going to change that error rate back to zero, and I'm going to run a retry command that will try to execute all the steps again. So similar to before, it is creating those two new pods to achieve that 40% that you were looking at earlier. And it now created another analysis run. So this analysis run is checking the same thing again of if the percentage of healthy requests for service is above 90%, we're good. And since the area is at zero, it will continue to make those measurements. So right now, the, with this demo, our rollout will wait an hour before we fully progress. So I'm going to run a command to skip the rest of this wait. And so now, we'll start to progress through the next steps. In case, if you don't remember, it will increase the ratio to 60%, wait 10 seconds, increase it to 80%, wait 10 seconds, and then progress all the way. So in probably around 10, 15 seconds, we should finish rolling out the new version. And during this time, we're still checking the analysis run to make sure that we're above that 90%. So you see this little red, or sorry, Green check slowly increment about every 10 seconds. And so at this point, we have successfully transitioned to the yellow version. And that concludes a demo of Argo rollouts with analysis. Yeah. 
So the next question is, okay, that's really cool, but how did you actually do it? So I'll kind of dive into the analysis template now. So the analysis template consists of one or more key metrics that you want to monitor while you're deploying a new version. And so each metric has a different provider that queries a backend service to take that measurement. In the case of our demo, we were using Prometheus, but we support a bunch of other providers, and the one I just want to call out in case if you don't know what it is, Kayenta is a canary analysis tool that lives under the Spinnaker project, but is, can be used as a standalone service. So to actually kind of dive into the template a little bit more, let's first start with the Prometheus provider. It's relatively straightforward. You specify a Prometheus address you want to query, but you also specify a PromQL query that you want to execute. When it executes, it grabs a measurement from Prometheus, but then that raises the question of how do you evaluate that metric? And so that's where success conditions come into play. Success conditions are a way of evaluating the results of your measurements from your providers. And you might notice that we're using an expression instead of a threshold. Well, since we have different providers, we realize that certain providers might return different payloads. And so we needed flexibility in how we interpret these results. And so to that end, not everything can just be a simple equality statement. And so at this point, you can say, okay, I can take a measurement, I can evaluate that metric measurement, how frequently do I do it? That's where interval and count come into play. So interval is how frequently we measure, take a measurement against our provider, and count is the total number of times we want to execute that provider. And so from there, there's one last concept I want to touch on for analysis, and that is arguments. Arguments enable developers to parameterize their analysis templates. In the case of our demo, we injected which ingress we wanted to query against from our rollout object. And that enables analysis templates to serve as building blocks for higher level resources like rollouts or, as Jesse will explain in a minute, experiments. And that allows the analysis to not worry about either details that it can't possibly know or really these higher level resources should be the one who care about them. And so another added benefit with this is that it allows analysis templates to become shareable. So not only can you use these analysis templates within your organization, you can also use them across communities. To give an example of that, the demo we are using today used a metric from the Nginx ingress controller. And so as a result, anyone here who uses that controller for their ingress, they can leverage to this analysis template. And so that's a high level overview of analysis. And I'm going to hand it back to Jesse to explain experimentation. Thanks, Henny. <clears throat> OK, so now that we talked a little about analysis, uh, we'll get into the second aspect of uh, Argo Rollout's progressive delivery, which is experimentation. And so we introduced this new concept, which we were calling an experiment. And really, an experiment is a, just an ephemeral run of one or more versions of your service. Um, it's most useful when you couple that with analysis. Um, experiments are something you can start uh, standalone, but it can also be something that you start as a blocking step in your rollout. And some use cases that we see for experimentation include things like A-B testing, baseline versus canary analysis, or even things like machine learning, machine learning model testing. Um, the thing I wanted to talk about, uh, baseline versus canary, uh, this is actually a, a good best practice for anyone who's doing canary analysis, that you actually want to test your uh, canary and compare it against a baseline and not your existing running prods in production. And the reason you want to do this is because uh, when you start up a brand new baseline, uh, you eliminate all the skewing factors in your, in your measurements uh, that, uh, for things like Java heap size or cache, caches that are already warmed up. 
So this is an experiment, CRD, um, which I'll be demoing in a minute. And really, it's uh, just a list of pod template specs instead of the, a single one like a rollout. Uh, it also has a duration. So this, this experiment will run for 15 minutes. Um, and it's going to run a purple version of our service and an orange version. Then on the bottom, you see that same similar analysis section. But this time, it's also a list. Um, here, I'm using a template called uh, HTTP Benchmark, which I'll show in a, minute, in a second. And I just wanted to point out here that the same template is being used multiple times, just passed with uh, different arguments, uh, one with the purple host name and the other with the orange host name. And finally, this is an example of another style of analysis which we provide, which is our job-based metric. And instead of a Prometheus query, this is a Kubernetes job. So for this metric to measure successful, um, the job itself needs to exit successfully, basically exit with exit code uh, zero. And this is uh, examples running a popular benchmarking utility called WRK, and then interpreting the output of that tool uh, to verify that the error rate is less than 5%. Okay, so. So I'm going to use that same. Um, kubectl plugin to start the experiment. Okay, so what's happening now is that this experiment launched two replica sets. Um, both replicas had uh, two replicas each. And what's going to happen is as soon as these pods become ready uh, and available, uh, it'll kick off the analysis. And uh, this is analysis, as you recall, was using the job-based metric. So I'll give it just a second. There it goes. OK, so it started analysis. It's running this job, I think, every uh, five or 10 seconds. And every, the success, the exit code of that job is going to determine whether or not um, that that experiment is going well. So as you can see, the purple version is, is measuring uh, error rate less than 5%, but the orange version is not. And you can tell by these uh, incrementing ticks going uh, up here. Um, and so uh, one thing I sh should point out is that experiments can also fail fast, uh, meaning like if your experiment is going horribly wrong, you can configure it to, so that it, it stops the experiment automatically. Um, and it's, experimentation is just a really simple concept, um, and it becomes much more powerful when you're using experimentation as part of your, uh, your rollout steps for doing things like canary versus baseline testing. All right. All right, so to summarize, what we showed uh, was how you can leverage these new concepts that we introduced, analysis and experiments, and integrate it to like, a rollout strategy and tailor it to your needs. And we designed this to be very flexible and loosely coupled so that it could be used not just with rollouts, but in other ways that we might not anticipate. Uh, we also wanted to point out that progressive delivery is multifaceted. Uh, there will never be this one-size-fits-all solution. For example, Intuit uh, makes heavy use of things like feature flags so that developers can experiment in canary uh, feature at a feature toggling level. And finally, this is just the beginning of progressive delivery and just how CD made the lives of developers uh, easier. We think that progressive delivery is going to have that same effect for operators. And in terms of what's next, what was noticeably absent in our talk was the use of a service mesh. And so in the future, what service mesh will give us is finer grain traffic shaping. Uh, this, I'm talking about doing things like segmenting your users based on HTTP headers or, or cookies. Um, and also, the metrics that we provided uh, were ones that we found useful for us. Uh, but this was meant to be open and extensible for other uh, types of metric providers, things like Datadog, New Relic, Wavefront. And so we would like your help and contribution there to make this more useful to the broader community. Okay. So here are some links that you can check out. 
In addition, Jesse and a couple of our colleagues have been writing a book on Kubernetes and GitOps. So you can scan that QR code on the left for a preview of the book. In addition, Intuit is hiring. And so if you're excited by progressive delivery or just solving Kubernetes at scale, feel free to scan that QR code or scan them both. And so with that, we'll open it up for some questions. Thank you for attending. Yeah, that was, that was amazing. That just, just well done. Thank you. A couple of uh, items before we go to questions. First of all, you don't need to rush for lunch because we have like a private lunch area here. We don't need to go with all the crowd downstairs. We have it right here. Second, don't forget to rate this talk. That's like five stars in your schedule application. Please do that. And we do have like five minutes for questions. I'll try to run the mic. I need to get my steps in today. <laughs> Hello. Yep. Thank you go. for the really nice talk. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. You mentioned that you uh, you you deploy like uh, 1,500 uh, deployments a day. Yeah. How do you manage the the queue that happens when you have to wait for all the validations and? How do we manage the? I'm sorry. The, the what? Uh, There's a queue that forms because you can't uh, the, the the delays of the valid, uh, validations. Uh, oh. Um, so hopefully I'm answering your question. Um, so one of the, in our delivery tool, Argo CD, uh, we actually have a concept of health of a resource. And so for things like deployments, uh, a healthy deployment, it actually is the same exact um, health when you run cube CTL rollout status on an object and then you're basically meeting your uh, available replicas and they all are, you, your count is desired and all that stuff. So in our, in our pipelines, there's this uh, gating step that it won't continue past that Jenkins step until the application itself is uh, in a healthy state. Because before that, it's actually in a state which, you, which we call progressing. Hopefully that answered your question. Also to that end, for anyone who asks a question, we have some Argo plushies <laughs> you can give out, so why don't you come on up? I could try throwing it, but got it. Yes. Hi. Um, how do you version your rollouts? Um, just version the rollouts? Yes. Um, so these are. Um, so I guess another question: with how do we version deployments? Uh, because rollouts are basically the same as deployments. Yes. Um, we we use GitOps, I guess, is the answer to that, and so. Uh, as part of our pipelines, um, uh, a step in the pipeline is actually to commit a new image tag to the Git repo, and then a call is made out to Argo CD, which then synchronizes the live state with what was just committed in the Git pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and how do you use test services right after um, a rollout, not based on these Prometheus, Prometheus metrics, you know, like service-specific tests, like, like a Helm test? Oh, yeah. Um, so that's also something that is uh, partly covered by the Jenkins pipelines that we run. So um, the pipeline looks like, OK, commit that, uh, that new image tag, wait for that application to be available and ready. And then some people will do uh, actual uh, integration tests, like run a test script from the Jenkins pipeline. But also, we think that the things like the job-based metric that I demonstrated uh, will have like a more uh, tightly coupled test, like a more smaller scoped test, which maybe they can access things that aren't accessible in, say, from the Jenkins namespace. Like maybe it needs to do something only accessible from within the cluster. OK, so, one last question. Sure. Uh, the analysis runs, they literally just test error rates, right? Uh, we do, uh, sorry, what's, what's that? Sorry, were you saying we don't? You were asking if we were only testing error rates? Yes. Oh. Um, so the nice thing about the analysis template is that it's totally configurable by the user. So you, you don't only have to test error rates. You could test other things like saturation. It's ultimately uh, dependent on what metrics that you have available. Yeah, if, if you get anything from this talk, uh, the one thing that we wanted to highlight was that the analysis template was basically gives the developers control of what they consider uh, interesting metrics for their specific application. 
And so uh, it's, we use the PromQL query, and they could write whatever PromQL query they want to extract the metrics that they care about. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Guys, uh, folks, we are out of time, so you can continue to ask questions. Just yeah, do it like um, that. we'll stick around and yeah. we'll answer uh, all the questions that you might have. Thank you very yeah. much again. Thanks, thank everyone. Yeah, thank you.